Not yet. Hey, oh, oh. Okay, there you are. There I am. Calling Chris Where Anderson you? in a closet someplace. Where I am. Are you? I, I am in a. I am. A, I am in a closet. Uh, this closet is called a hotel room in Paris, but it, it does resemble a closet. And uh, calling Rick Byer in. It looks like spacious and sumptuous Chicago. Chicago, right? It's the the Chicago headquarters of History Happy Hour. Outstanding. Welcome everybody to History Happy Hour, brought to you with the help of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours, offering a variety of history tours in Europe, the U.S., and the Pacific. Check it out at stephenambrosetours.com. And you just finished a World War One tour. I did. Yep, I was I was in the trenches until uh, just yesterday. It was actually it was really pretty moving. We were uh, at the Musée Argonne American Cemetery largest American cemetery in Europe uh, at 11 o'clock on November 11th. Mm. So uh, and you, you had a history happy hour uh, we faithful did. viewer there with we you. Did. Yeah. yeah. We had Susan Yu join us. And Susan, aside from having a tremendous taste in headwear, uh, <laughs> I would say has a tremendous taste in guides. And she and her husband uh, joined us for two weeks uh, on our World War One trip, which was great. It was great to see her in person. Uh, and she proudly wore her history happy hour hat. Which is that the first time you met her? Uh, well, in the flesh. I mean, other than virtually. I mean, obviously, we've seen her many, many times yeah, in the audience yeah. on our show. And I don't know if she's here this week. But um, listen, whether you are watching live, watching a replay, or listening on the HHH podcast, thank you for joining us. Absolutely. And today we'll be talking about submarines at the Battle of Midway. And I want to take a moment to thank everybody who is supporting us on Patreon, uh, especially our top shelf patrons and you can help keep the history taps running by becoming a top shelf patron and joining us at patreon.com slash history happy hour and chris who do we have out there that uh, in in viewing land we have a few people it looks like have tuned in we do we do have uh we have uh, dave borland from uh, madrid and uh, ann ballard from little rock brian peacock uh cindy and brian both from uh, myrtle myrtle beach damn lucky guys uh joining us and they're having a sync pack, by the way. Oh, fantastic. Dave Borland is in Madrid. He does not live in Madrid, so he is. Oh. And Doug McCord is in Barcelona. Our entire oh. audience is going wow. to Spain. What is Dave going to show up? Uh, buenos, buenos noches, senor. Oh. Okay, no, I can't really. Stop, stop, stop. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And do you have a drink tonight, Chris? Uh, I, no, I, I'm in between bottles of Von Blanc. So okay. Ms. Well, Mrs. I, Anderson says it's Von Blanc. Where are you I going? have a beer, and so I'll drink for everybody on the show. Are you supposed to have a sink pack? I mean, Pacific shows usually have sink packs. Oh, that's, that would have been a good idea. But I can go do one now, and you can talk to Mark for the first 20 minutes without me. But uh, would... no. All right. Give me a cue, Chris. Let's get this baby underway. Yeah. Oh, where's it? Where? Hang on. Okay, I'm ready. Open. The bar is open. And this week we're going to be talking with uh, our guest is Mark W. Allen. He has a master's degree in military history from the American Military University. He is the former historian and volunteer coordinator for the War Memorial Park Museum in Muskegee, Oklahoma, home of the USS Batfish, a World War II fleet submarine. And he is the author of a new book that comes to us via Casemate Publishing and uh, see if I can find it here. It's called Midway Submerged, and it is the story, oh my gosh, I, I don't seem to have, I, I have to hold it up this time. Visual aid, visual, okay. there you go. Visual Midway aid. Submerged, uh, and it is the story of American and Japanese submarine operations at the Battle of Midway in World War II. Mark Allen, thank you so much for joining us on History Happy Hour. Thank you for joining us, Mark. My pleasure, thank you. Um, so, um, Mark, when we think of the Battle of Midway, which takes place in June 1942, I think most of us think of aircraft carriers, because uh, that's kind of, it's the big clash of aircraft carriers early in the war. So what drew you to want to investigate the role of submarines at Midway? Well, I had always enjoyed submarines. I grew up in Muskogee, where the Batfish was. And when I started my degree program, I wanted to do my thesis on something called, you know, around submarines. So I, I've, I've enjoyed studying the Battle of Midway, but I realized not a whole lot had been had talked about submarine wise. 
And when I got looking into it, a lot of it was like, oh, the submarines failed, the submarines failed. And I thought, well, this is going to be an easy thesis to do because <laughs> everyone all thinks they failed. Thesis, yes. So I, I got into it and it's like, well, the primary sources, they're, they're talking a different story here. And that they were, you know, everyone seems, like you said, the, the Battle of Midway is carriers. And, you know, naval aviation did win the battle. But the story of the submarine really hasn't been told. I mean, other than basically, yeah, they didn't position them right. They didn't. They didn't put them where they thought the Japanese were going to show up. They basically used them wrong. But that's not the true story of the submarine for both sides at, at Midway. And so it's like, well, this is going to be an interesting story to kind of get in and figure out what actually happened. Okay, so so Mark, just before we you know, before we get to uh the battle and the submarines part of the battle i think it'd be helpful why don't you tell us a little bit about kind of the origins of the, the submarine forces on both sides uh, and maybe um sort of what condition they were in at the start of the war you know, what, what kind of forces are, are, are both sides bringing to the battle well i guess the submarine wise the japanese had better submarines technical te technologically advanced more than the United States. They were older um, fleet boats, not as much range, not as much speed, and usually didn't carry as many torpedoes. So the overall concept of how each side used the submarine was for basically fleet support, eyes and ears. They'd send them out in, in advance of the fleet and uh, They'd try to scout and look for enemy forces, and they'd report back to the the main the main commanders and say, "This is where we've identified." So they they'd sweep out, look for it, and that's basically before the war, before World War II. That's the general concept of how the submarines were to be used. They were just to attack primary fleet, like battleships, aircraft carriers, you know, the, mm -hmm. the big capital ships. Uh, for the United States, that changed uh, when Pearl Harbor happened because it took out the battleships and, and they had to use submarines more as um, the, the attack, the commerce of, of Japan, try to hit their, their life lifelines, life uh, supplies as they because they were island nation. So they had to supply things via merchant ships. So, and, so I guess because what you're saying then is just because this is an, inter an interesting point, you're saying that part of the what drove America's sort of turn towards wiping out the Japanese merchant fleet was kind of an after effect of Pearl Harbor. Yes, yes, because they both they both wanted to use. I mean, that's how they trained their commanders of the submarines is to be um, advanced scouts for the fleet. Um, and it was only after Pearl Harbor that they they changed their the United States changed their philosophy to go after merchant shipping. The Japanese really never made that that change because if they would have, they had ample opportunity after Pearl Harbor, as as the supplies were going back and forth between you know the West Coast and Hawaii, right. to, to significantly disrupt that supply chain. Yeah. Yeah. So, Mark, I mean, but here's so so you talk about that each side is trying to use their submarines kind of as part of their fleet operation. And, and what I'm thinking of is that, um, you know, in all their planning, they must have looked at what the Germans did in World War One when the Germans go out and they declare unrestricted submarine warfare against the Allies. They sink 10 million tons of cargo. The, this almost brings Britain to her knees. Then in World War Two. May 1940, uh, Germany again declares unrestricted submarine warfare on shipping, and they're doing all this commerce raiding, having a lot of success with it. So did the American and Japanese planners basically just ignore that, or did they think that they had a better idea? The American planners, they did change, like like I just mentioned. They, they were forced to, whether they would have or not based on but Pearl Harbor never happened, I don't know. The Japanese were of a single mindset of the big fleet decisive battle. And there's documentation, even you know, the Germans would 
tried to convince Japan to go after the, the merchant shipping, and they had a hard time. They eventually tried to switch gears somewhere about mid-42, I believe, tried to say, oh, yeah, we, we need to go after the merchant shipping as well as capital ships. But that that really never was their their main target. It was always yeah. You 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 and you have an interesting item in as one of your appendices, and I I just love saying the word appendices, appendices. because it makes me feel very learned. Uh, and it's a post war interview with German Admiral Vice Admiral Paul Venneker, who was the naval attaché in Japan from 1940 to 1945, and he basically says the Germans are trying to convince the Japanese to attack U.S. merchant shipping, and the Japanese keep saying no. We have to save the submarines to attack the U.S. fleet. So do you have any idea, either something that you came across in your research or your own kind of thought about it as to why the Japanese, you know, seem to just ignore the preponderance of evidence of what the Germans had done and what had been successful in submarines up to that time? I don't really know their, what their thinking was other than their their overall mentality was they were always after the big fleet engagement. One big blow, one decisive blow, take out the enemy ship and we will have control of the sea. And that's, I mean, even if you look at their torpedo allotment, what they're, they were ordered to fire at certain ships, you know, merchant ships were, were relegated to one torpedo. Capital ships like battleships and air, aircraft carriers, you know, full salvo. So, so, so in other words, a submarine commander, he's got a big merchant ship in his sight, and he only has one shot at it. He can't that, fire three torpedoes at it. No, he was out. He was ordered to only expand one torpedo. And it, well, go ahead. No, no, I was just saying. So, so one of the you know, this kind of leads into a question I had, or something I'd like you to kind of expand upon. One of the things that struck me reading the book was both navies. Uh, are heavily influenced, which is an understatement, uh, by Alfred Thayer Mahan uh, and so how he views the battle. Um, so uh, both navies are bringing sort of the baggage of that to this, this, this moment in history. So I think it would be really helpful maybe if you could talk about, you know, Alfred Thayer Mahan and, and how important he is to both sides and, and wh how that leads to this, you know, the great, the great battle or the, or the, or the one battle idea that, you know, you say that both arm, both navies, excuse me, uh, had. But you'll have to forgive me. It's been a while since I studied Mahan, but, um, he was very influential. Um, they sent Japan sent some of their top, um, naval officers to the United States to learn from him, but he, they returned back to Japan and they tried to integrate his teaching with still with the, the Japanese mentality of the big fleet battle. Mm -hmm. So it's like they almost picked and choose parts that they wanted that, that supported their philosophy. But, but, but I mean, I guess my question is, did, did Mahan give them the idea of the big fleet battle or, or did they have this and Mahan kind of backed them up on what they were thinking? Honestly, no, I, mean, I, might... I don't, I can't remember. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, taking a look again, uh, you know, we, and, you, and you sort of, in the book, you sort of start with the, what is the broad uh, strategy of the Japanese and then the strategy of the Americans and then how it plays out at Midway. Um, and, and, and as you are talking about the development of, of plans for the Battle of Midway, uh, you say that the Japanese in general and uh, Admiral Yamamoto in particular we're suffering from victory disease. So what do you mean by victory disease and how did that impact this battle? Well, the victory disease is, it's like they, they can't be defeated. What they're going to do is they're going to do this plan A, B, C, and D, and they're going to do this plan every time they attack because it's always worked in the past and it's like com they get complacent in it. They, they may make the plan, they may leave out a certain step that they normally would do because they, they're complacent with the overall plan. And then that step gets overlooked and that maybe a, where it wasn't such a key point at a previous battle turns in to be a key point. It's like the submarine 
uh, at Midway. The, at Pearl Harbor, they would they use the submarines to go advance of the fleet, sweep the ocean, make sure there was no one out in, in Pearl Harbor. At Midway, there was I'm not even sure there was an operational plan until like maybe a month before the battle, because it's one of those things they they just didn't think about it. And I talk a little bit about there, maybe there was an ulterior motive for what Yamamoto had, but they put the submarines out into like static locations. So it, that's kind of a, an offshoot of what the victory disease was. It's like, we're so used to winning that we just anticipate we're going to win. So everything we do is just going to work itself out in the end. And they end up like in the, on, in this case on the submarines, they didn't use a sweeping pattern that's like go out here this fixed point and just wait for the american carriers to sail through and then report back to us and then we'll bring in the fleet to destroy them if that so, makes sense so the, the, so the japanese in terms of the, the submarines anyway don't seem to have really that much of a plan i mean they have a they, i guess they have a doctrine the big fleet you know the decisive battle but they're not integrated into this plan for this upcoming battle at Midway, is that? Not for Midway, best I could tell. I mean, what they always had was the submarines would always lead the fleet out. They'd sweep the ocean, look for whatever enemy ships out there. And then they would always cover the withdrawal of the, of the Japanese fleet away from the battle. Okay. So this time they, they were late getting on station because of various reasons. And then they were told not to sweep, but to go out to these fixed locations and, and wait. And that's that's different from what they had done in, in the past on all their other engagements. So there's a map in your book, and I'm going to throw it on the screen here. Uh, and it's a, probably a little bit confusing to people. But you can see uh, uh, Hawaii down in the lower right of the map. You can see just to the left uh, of the middle there, I think you have... I'm looking at it. Uh, yeah, to the left, the middle is Midway, right underneath that line that says you. And these are the lines, I believe, and you can correct me um, if I'm wrong, uh, uh, that the Japanese are trying to set up to anticipate uh, the Americans. Um, it's essentially, it's a picket line, a multi-level picket line between Pearl Harbor and Midway to give them notice of the American advance. But it ends up failing completely. Uh, and I guess the question is why, uh, and I would then add to that question, and I have no idea if these things are related, but I'm just you know, trying to throw it in, is um, uh, you, you talked about uh, Admiral Yamamoto maybe having an ulterior motive in setting things up this way. So, so talk about why this doesn't work, and then what maybe Yamamoto's motive is. Okay, first of all, why it didn't work is the first two lines, A and B, were the initial locations of where these two lines of submarines were to be stationed. And the key one for the Japanese would be uh, Cordon B or Subron 5. It was. So Subron 5 is the name of a Japanese group of submarines. That is correct. And so they were the ones that were actually tasked with finding or identifying spotting whatever the word you want to use the the american carriers coming out of hawaii um to get in state on station outside of midway um so they they were supposed to be on station on june 1st they didn't make it till june 3rd but uh, the sub the american carriers had already passed through there i think the last one was the yorktown on may 31st so the submarines were on station um, two days after the carriers had already passed through there. And, it, and, and people like to blame that, that one of the reasons why Jap Japan lost the battle was. Right. Well, that. that's what you were saying at the beginning is that right. people said, oh, they failed because they were late. End of story. But it's not the end of the story. No. See, what. Yamamoto anticipated so his whole plan fell. Well, it needed the Americans to act like he had planned for them to. If they had deviated from what he anticipated them doing, then his plan would fall apart. So he anticipated 
the American carriers to come out of your um, out of goodness out of Hawaii after the invasion force had occupied occupied Midway, and so he that would have put them through that area sometime around June seventh, and so even if they were two days later or, or, or whatever, they were still on station before Yamamoto's anticipated date for the American carriers to leave Hawaii. So that you can't use that as an excuse why they lost because they, even if his plan was accurate, they were still on station four days before the American carriers would have left. So you're for- essentially saying it's, <clears throat> it's not that they were late. It's that Yamamoto's plan sucked. It was, I don't well, yeah, know if it sucked too much, but it was, <laughs> it was definitely, it, the, Japan liked to do things big scale. So they had mul- multiple pieces moving around, certain timelines that had to be adhered to, and they, they needed the enemy to act accordingly, or if it, or, and, you know, not know that what they were doing, which the operational intelligence part of it already had blown up on them. So it, 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 it wasn't so much that it sucked. It was like it, it, they had such a strict adherence to whatever he had planned. That if any one of those things failed, his whole plan fell apart. Yeah. And in this, in this part, the Americans, they, they knew he was coming and they didn't act like Yamamoto had anticipated him that they would. And, well, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to the Americans in a minute, but, but since you, know, you talk about this in the book, but... Um, I think you said something, I might be paraphrasing, but, you know, Japanese intelligence, not only does it fail, but it's almost non-existent. Um, why, do you, why do you think that is? Yeah, the, uh, the, I, I have the quote, Chris. It's, it is hard to believe that the same men who had done the careful intelligence work for the Pearl Harbor attack could have done the haphazard job of the Midway operation. That's a quote from a Japanese officer in your book. Yes, I remember that. Yeah. Well, so Why? Well, there was a lot, there was a point out roughly 700 miles uh, west of Midway where, it's, where the occupational po- force all rendezvoused. And the Americans had stuck a submarine out there, the USS Cuttlefish. And it, it, it and it, there was a PBY actually out there that had spotted it. And a, a PBY, explain what a PBY is. It's, it's just a long range reconnaissance aircraft. I, I didn't have a, a photo in the book. Yeah, but this is but, the cuttlefish. Uh, that's, right. that's the cuttlefish. And it was it was stationed out about 700 miles west of Midway, where intelligence had said that the occupational force was supposed to rendezvous. And it actually spotted, I believe, a, a tanker at that location. And so the cuttlefish was reporting back to Midway or yeah, Midway or Pearl, I can't remember the top of my head. And so there was all this, and, and the Japanese were, were monitoring this. So they knew there was, there was radio traffic going on, but they had radio silence going on. So they couldn't, they couldn't tell uh, Nagumo and, on the carriers that oh, I think we might have been spotted. So there was a strict adherence to, um, you know, radio silence. And so that, they, they didn't know they were basically sailing into a trap. Uh, French frigate shoals when the they, they, uh, flying boats, the Japanese flying boats showed up there, they were going to use that for uh, submarine refueling but they, the Americans knew that as well so they stuck a seaplane tender, a seaplane tender out there and so they canceled that and that was supposed to be a reconnaissance uh, a mission for the submarines so they canceled that so every, every intelligence tasks that they tried to instigate, the Americans were foiling it one way or another. And so the Japanese are basically sailing to Midway blind because they had no intelligence. Yeah, I want to bring this map back. And I don't know if this is the best one uh, to see, but uh, you mentioned French frigate Shoals, and that's right there under the line that says B. uh, And that's fairly close to Hawaii, or relatively close. And they were trying to use that as a kind of a station to send from their uh, uh, submarines to Pearl Harbor to check and see if the U.S. fleet was still there. And this is an operation that's completely undone 
uh, you write by American Intelligence, right? That is, um, and, and talk a little bit, if you can, about the American Intelligence effort and about this, this fellow right here, Roquefort, who's the, uh, who's the kind of brains behind that, because that is a big part of what um, disrupts the Japanese plans, is that we've got an amazing window into what they want to do. Yes, that's that's Rochert, and and his team actually broke uh, the code they were the Japanese were using, and were able to determine that uh, uh, Midway was the target of their invasion attempt. And he knew there was a strike force coming, and he knew there was an occupational force coming. Right, and and we should we should um, I'm going to bring up another graphic here, but. Uh, to t tell us this is and this this is a graphic showing kind of where the submarines are, where these two forces are. What is the difference between the strike force and the occupation force? Because this may be a little bit uh, more detailed than most people have thought about when they're thinking about the Battle of Midway. Sure, the striking force is is basically contains uh, the four fleet carriers that J Japan was going to use to destroy the U.S. task forces. Um, the occupational force had the men and equipment to occupy Midway. Um, the striking force, of course, with the aircraft carrier would, would be essential to the invasion because you need to make sure you've, you basically have air superiority over the island you're trying to occupy. So it was important for the Japanese to make sure they had the striking force there first before the occupational force arrived. So, uh, Mark, we, you know, we've been talking a lot about the Japanese, but obviously there are two sides to this battle. Um, so, could you tell us a little bit or get a little bit more into um, what's Nimitz planning to do with his submarine force? Uh, where do they where do they kind of fit into the overall plan for all this? Well, Nimitz, he had limited resources that since he lost the, all his his um, battleships. All he basically had was cruisers and aircraft carriers, and he needed to use those in an offensive mash, uh, fashion because he had to take out the uh, Japanese carriers. That was uh, the first task. And But he also knew that the occupational force would have to be dealt with, and all he really had left was the submarines. So the, the submarines weren't geared for defense or more of an offensive weapon. But that's all he had, so he tried to vector him out in where they would be available to, to attack the striking force if they got within range. But then they would always be available to protect the midway because he knew the occupational force was coming from the west or southwest. And do you, and do you think, because he, he, he had been a sub, submarine commander, I mean, do you think he was effective in their use or could he have done more with them or uh, you know because again when, when people read about midway they don't talk a lot about the submarine so it, you know no and and that's kind of the whole point of the book because I, that's that's the kind of the, the rabbit trail i was going down it says why didn't he use them correctly because it's like you know where they were going to come they were going to be at this this i think he said five miles five degrees and, and five minutes from the actual uh, intelligence report. It's like, well, you knew they were gonna be out there, just set you a, a line of, um, of submarines and wait for them. Mm -hmm. But even even then, I mean, you, the aircraft from, um, uh, I forget which one, the Enterprise or the Hornet, they were up at, at you know, 15,000 feet searching a vast expanse of ocean and they had trouble finding them. And I think I make I made the point. What do you think a slow-moving submerged submarine is going to find if if the aircraft carrier from above can't find them? Right. So they didn't know where they they were at. And then, on top of everything, is is uh, if you read, read the part about the Nautilus when it did attack, the, the American torpedoes in the early part of the war were terrific or were horrible. Right. Um, they they wouldn't if if you didn't have like a if you had a direct hit they would crumple the firing pin it wouldn't detonate. Right. So you you, you were going to send <laughs> out awkward. I know. Right. So so putting submarines out in the the anticipated path with the fault 
with faulty torpedoes probably wasn't the best use of the submarines. Because every, I mean, even Admiral Ernest King, him no English, he wanted to use them more offensively as well. But Nimitz said, overrode him and said, no, we got to use those to defend the island and we'll use the naval aviation for our attack, our attack uh, on the Japanese. So, guys, we are talking. Uh, no, almost. I did mute myself. Yeah. Uh, we're talking today with Mark Allen, who's the author of Midway Submerged, American and Japanese Submarine Operations at the Battle of Midway, May to June 1942. And uh, I, you, you mentioned the Nautilus there, and uh, we have a great picture of the Nautilus that you sent us. And, you know, one of the things that you include in the book, in the, in the uh, lengthy uh, appendixes, is you include all the reports, or many of the reports, of American submarines in and around Midway. So it's like the, the primary source material. And most of them are pretty quiet. But the Nautilus has quite a day on June 5th, or June 4th, uh, 1942, which is the day of the aircraft carrier battle. Uh, can you kind of walk us through a little bit the, the day of the Nautilus and all the stuff that they that they encounter because they they have I think you say at the end of the day they have uh, they've had 42 uh, depth charges dropped on them and they fired five torpedoes and for a torpedo for a submarine on its very first wartime patrol <laughs> that must be like a kind of seared in their memory kind of day yes it would be very exciting I guess is maybe maybe <laughs> not exciting but maybe um, more excitement than uh, than you're looking for yeah they, they happened to be kind of right in the line of, of the advancing striking force. So you can they, see it right there, right? Yeah. So the grouper, the grayling, the grenadier, they, they didn't do anything, but the striking force came apparently right upon the Nautilus. And that's like, you know, you're a submerged submarine and you almost have to have it come right on top of you because you're not going to, you're not going to catch it. And if you can't see it until it's right there, you're not going to get an attack on it. But yeah, they were right in the middle of it. And I know they caused a bunch of confusion. Um, they, I guess they popped their periscope up to try to get a setup on a battleship. And I guess it, it started scattering all the ships and everything. Uh, they got a couple of shots off, but then they were, they were held down. I, I forget the amount of time they were, but yeah, like 42 some odd uh, depth charges. Um, but, that had had a, probably the greatest effect on the battle of any submarine that was there because the the I believe it's called the Arash the Arashi I can't right I'm, the Japanese I'm, ship not pronouncing that correctly or not That's but it right. was, it was ordered to stay there and keep the Nautilus pinned down and so they depth charged it uh, for a while and then it's like okay we're gonna hightail it back to our our fleet and so they left the Nautilus submerged and just they, they hightailed it back to the carriers. Well, I think it was Wade McCluskey up at, you know, up in uh, one of the SBDs saw it. And he, he, he played a hunch and thinking it's going to, it's heading somewhere important because it's a high tail. We're going to, we're going to follow that. And it took them right back. To right. The so they turned the, the dive bombers and it led them right to the aircraft carriers. Right. So without actually doing anything that it, the, the Nautilus kind of helped guide those the dive bombers because they didn't know where the carriers were. But it, by by their act of keeping a a, a Japanese destroyer occupied and then hightailing it back to the fleet allowed them to to make a, a good you know strike on one of the carriers. And and then just following up on that, then the Nautilus uh, eventually comes on the Kaga, right? The uh, isn't that right? The Japanese. Yes. Uh, uh, aircraft carrier, um, and there's a great shot here that you include in the book, and I, it's also on the cover of your book, but this is from the periscope of the Nautilus looking at the Kaga. Now, they can be forgiven for thinking that one of their torpedoes must have hit that ship, but they fired three torpedoes at that ship, and apparently none of them exploded, right? No, I think two of them missed. One of them did hit it, but it, it hit it in such a way that the, the the head of the torpedo broke off and that the Japanese 
uh, that were in the water were actually using the body as a floating device. <laughs> so yeah, the, 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 hit, the warhead broke off and sank. And, and so, but yeah, they didn't know that at the time. So they thought, Oh, we, we hit it. And, um, you know, the, uh, God, what's his name? It totally escaped me. The the commander Brockman? of the Brockman, that's it. He actually got a, a medal, not a medal of honor, but a, a Navy, Cross Navy Cross for that. Right. Um, because he thought he he gave the uh, the the hit that actually sunk the, the carrier when, when, in fact, his torpedoes didn't do anything. Well, he was in the right place at the right time. So that's worthy right. of it's a participation prize. <laughs> we, we appreciate that you tried. Uh, uh, Rockman, but uh, you know, you can't can't always get what you want. But he was he was uh, an aggressive skipper, which uh, at that time was more one of the the rare type skippers. More more of them were more cautious, but uh, he was right there and he was going after him. So, you know, yeah, you said that was a problem in the first two years of the wars that, or first, I don't know if it was two years, but the first part of the war is that the American skippers were. Uh, not very aggressive until they basically, you know, replaced them. Right. They were they were given grades more on how clean their ship was, and 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 during uh, training exercises, uh, got got more awards if they weren't detected. Um, and it just it it. it right. So if you're it, being awarded for not being detected, you can hide back as opposed to dying, jumping in and trying to get close. Exactly. And then when you're you're called on to actually go into a war zone, you've not been trained to do so. You've been basically trained to shoot on sound and don't be seen. And that that's just that's a bad combination. And it would it would wear the, the skippers out and a lot of them would actually turn the control of the submarine over to their executive officer because it just i don't know if it's like today's version of you know pstd pstd ptsd yeah PTSD. sure so i mean if it you're constantly fear of fear of failure fear of making a mistake and you'd be constantly in the control room or at the periscope on the bridge and you just you just basically wear out so, so, I mean, assuming, you know, you weren't on the crew of Nautilus, let's just say hypothetically, uh, you know, you're on Grenadier or any of the other submarines that are there uh, around that screen there. What does the battle look like to you? If you're writing your letter home afterwards, what do you say? Dear mom and dad, I was at Midway. This is what it was like. What was it like for the rest of these carry uh, rest of these submarines? Well, they would get the same orders as like everyone else got. You know, it's like when they were ordered to a particular patrol section, and you know, patrol your area. And then when the when the fleet was sighted, it's like okay, you need all the submarines to go to this location and attack Japanese shipping. And then when that was done, they were ordered back to their to their patrol area. So some of them, it was just it was a lot of movement. Is that me? No, I don't know, uh, but it's gone now. Okay. It's gone now. You're good. There was a lot of movement and not a lot of action. Right. Um, ultimately, may, probably three submarines saw action. The Cuttlefish, when it encountered the occupational force, the Nautilus, of course, and then the Tambor, which uh, spotted what they thought was an occupational force, which was basically just four heavy cruisers coming to shell the island. Other than that, most of the submarines didn't do a whole lot. They were on station um, to look for shipping for Japanese ships. And a lot of them, some of the other task forces of task group seven didn't see anything. They were just out in the ocean, just waiting to be recalled back. Yeah. So I want to jump back to the uh, uh, Japanese submarines for a moment, if I can. Uh, there's a submarine, the I-168, that actually sinks the only two ships that the Japanese end up uh, hitting uh, in the American fleet, which is the aircraft carrier Yorktown and the destroyer, uh, is it, uh, uh, I want to say Hamas, but that's not right. Not, <laughs> different, it's, different news story. Different yeah, news it's, story. <laughs> it's close to that. Um, and uh, you quote uh, Zenji Orita, the captain of the Japanese submarine, as saying, had our submarines been used properly and effectively, 
the history of Pacific Naval War might have been written quite differently. So what does he mean when he says that? And how do you evaluate you know, how true that statement is? I think it goes back to, the, to what we mentioned earlier about the sweeping action versus the static locations. I think uh, at Midway, they were ordered to go certain locations and just wait where other times during the war, they were told to go in front of the fleet and sweep out our path, make sure there's no you know, enemy in front of us. And so I think that's just kind of a re reaffirmation of the fact that they weren't using the submarines as they normally used them at this point in the war. And um, yeah, that. I mean, do you I think there's yeah. an alternate history that that you could write uh, if you were inclined to write uh, alternate history fiction in which the Japanese use their submarines in such a way that uh, it changes the course of this battle? Yeah, I think one of, I can't remember who, um, but I, I talk about that, that if they would actually use the sweeping lines of the submarines that they would have probably found the carriers to the northeast of Midway. Um, one one of the Japanese officers, I believe, states that. Yeah. And the then that would have led them to be able to attack the Americans much earlier than they did. Yes, they would. They would have known they're there. Then they would see because what happened? The Japanese got caught attacking Midway instead of attacking the the United States fleet. They were. They were bombing Midway, trying to take out the runways, whatever. And then, you know, then they got the call that, oh, I think we found the carrier. So they were switching out ordnance and gas lines strung out all over the deck when the United States dive bombers arrived. That's why they, they went up so fast. And so they were caught attacking the island. If they knew that the sub, if, um, their submarines had spotted the American fleet, they could have abandoned their attack on, on Midway and, and gone to do what they were supposed to, according to Yamamoto, they were supposed to destroy the United States fleet. Okay. So this, is, this kind of picks up on Rick, what Rick was just asking, uh, Mark, but given the performance of the submarines on both sides during the battle, um, did, the, did this battle have any impact on how they were used afterwards? I mean, did, did the results of midway cause either navy to say hey wait a minute maybe there's a different way we can do this or or do we do, or do both sides stick with the doctrine that they had going into the battle no i think at this point in the war both of them were were i mean the united states for sure because they they pulled those off uh attacking merchant ships to defend the island so they already knew that was the, the proper use for their submarines uh -huh. i think the japanese they were they were in the process of switching over at that point, but uh, eventually, I mean, it got to the point where they ended up using their submarines for transportation, because every time we, you know, they would send a, a ship full of material or men or, or equipment or whatever, uh, the United States submarines would sink them, yeah. so they they'd have to send them by uh, by submarine in order to get there unseen. In, in order not to get their, their shipping you know, lost by by tax by uh, by this time they were using a lot of the Americans were using wolfpack tactics. It's rough when you're trying to use submarines for shipping because <laughs> they don't have not a lot big. of room in them. No, and they don't they have unli they don't have a an unlimited range either. Their their range would be a lot smaller or a lot shorter than uh, like a regular merchant ship or a yeah. tanker. So, Mark, you dived into the research on this project uh, uh, from the beginning, thinking, uh, as you said, when you started, you thought, well, both sides kind of failed to use their submarines, and uh, so this will be an easy, uh, easy paper, um, and not so easy as you thought it would be. Um, what surprised you the most in your research that seemed different from kind of the accepted conventional history of uh, submarines in this battle? I guess what surprised me the most was the fact that Nimitz had an ulterior plan for his submarines. I never 
because like I said, everything you read about Midway is naval aviation. And it's like, I, I didn't even really, before I really started this, I didn't know submarines were really even involved at Midway. And so I would read the, the papers and the books and they say, and I have several examples, you know, subs failed, whoever placed the subs where they did, you know, was wrong. And so it's like, well, I wanted to know why they were wrong. And that, that's, a, that's kind of where I went down. So it surprised me that Nimitz was like, well, I've got a, I've got an occupational force. I'm also going to, I'm, I'm thinking offensively and I'm thinking defensively. And that, that was probably the biggest, I guess, eye opener for me was there was a two prong attack on Midway because I didn't realize it or didn't understand it at that point. And so I was thinking carriers as well. It's like, we got to stop the carriers. Why didn't they use their submarines to stop the carriers? And honestly, I didn't even know there were that many Japanese submarines at the battle. So it's just the, the key point I learned out of all this is always jump back to the primary sources to find out what the people at that mm. time were thinking. Because so, so, oh, go, go ahead. Because anytime you do, you take someone else's work on that, you're putting a layer of interpretation that may or may not be correct. So you always go back to the primary sources. That was probably my biggest takeaway from all of this. Well, and it sounds like you like what you're saying is that um, if I'm reading correctly, you know, from what you say and, and from reading the book, is that Nimitz, whether he told people publicly this or not, was essentially using the submarines, you know, like like if we don't get their aircraft carriers, the submarines are going to help us defend against this invasion force. And in fact, I think you even have quotes in there from a few people saying, you know, had had the naval aviation battle worked out differently, and now you've got this Japanese invasion force that's moving in from the the west, that they believe that the submarines would have been uh, in a good position to um, to to kind of stop them uh, and 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 do some damage on them as they're trying to land troops on Midway. Yes, that is correct. That was their their primary their primary order operational order was to oppose the occupational force. And then if they had the opportunity, uh, part B, I guess, if you want to call it, would be at, attack the striking force. Because they, that's where they were. The striking force was found. They were ordered to attack the striking force. That got taken care of by naval aviation. And then they were ordered back into their defensive sectors for what they still assumed the occupational force was still on its way. So, yes, it's... They were their their primary goal was was defense. So, so Mark, you know, having like as you said, dived into the primary sources, um, are there? I would, I'd like to know a little bit more about um, sort of your research. Were there? Was it easy to find material that hadn't been looked at, or did you find something more? I mean, what what was the kind of the difficult part of your research? And you know, talk to us a little bit about how you dug all this stuff out. Because Rick and I like to get, you know, free advice. So Yeah, because we're always looking for how we can improve our own status yes. in, in the yeah. world. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to admit, it, it was kind of tough um, to find some of this. Uh, I did locate uh, some people that basically sold some of these things. They, they'd get the documents in, scan them, burn them on DVD. Uh, he's no longer in business now, unfortunately. But um, yeah, the Japanese monographs were key to getting inside the head of the Japanese. Yeah. Um, when I started this back in 2008, I believe, uh, I, I can't remember. I mean, the internet was up and running and that's where I found a lot of this. But um, I don't know how much of available was through like from the National Archives or anything. I mean, the, the patrol reports were, of course, because that's where I got them. But from the Japanese side or I mean, even now today, there's stuff that they haven't even got digitally. So uh, the, the archives are the Library of Congress. So even in, it, it took me a while to dig out a lot of this. I mean, it's just you just start start looking and, and you talk to people and say, well, what about this? And my my graduate advisor, he said, well, you need to look at these things. And and then you, you get something. And the first thing I would do is look through their reference list. It's like, 
what do I need out of this? What are they using? Right. And it, it just turns in, sometimes it turns into a big rabbit hole because you'll follow one and follow another. And then you find out it's a dead end. It doesn't give you anything. <laughs> they're all, they're all, we know all about other. rabbit holes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've but, been there. But, but every once in a while you'll grab onto something. It's like, man, this is a gold mine of information. And, um, that's how it was with this one website. He, this is the guy who sold these, these, uh, like Japanese monographs. It's like he had just about every one of them. And so, and they were like, you know, five bucks a piece. So it's like, give me all of them. And uh, it's just, then it's just a matter of reading it. And it's, it just, sometimes it, it's more work doing the, the literature search than it is writing the paper. And, oh yeah. And sometimes this, this was, this was that because there was, there was a lot of stuff out there. I just couldn't get to it. Yep. Yep. Uh, hey, I want to bring in a question from our audience, and I, 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 this is one that I want to know the answer to as well. Uh, Yvonne says, the striking force gets destroyed, but what happens with the occupation force ships? And, and as you answer that, if you can remember the number, how, how many soldiers are those ships carrying, and then what happens to them? Oh, I can't remember the number. I, I want to say it was in the thousands, but um, I can't remember the exact number. But um, once once the four carriers were lost, uh, they canceled the whole invasion. So they basically turned around and, and headed back. The um, there was a bombardment scheduled with the, the force cruisers, the Makuma, was the one that got damaged. Uh, they they took off with by they couldn't get to midway by the time that the the sun would have have arisen. And so they were like 90 miles out of Midway when they were recalled back. And then as they were heading back toward the Japanese fleet, that's when they were spotted by the, the fleet submarine Tambor. And um, two cruisers ran into one another. Um, and one started trailing oil. And then I, th I, can't, I can't remember which carrier launched a strike for it, and they ended up sinking it. I think there's a, a, a Bel Geddes diorama that kind of shows that. I no, I, I don't think I have uh, that. Yeah, oh, I, okay. I, I know what you're talking about, but I don't. I don't have that here in the list. Okay. I, I fail. I fail on that. So, but anyway, that, that's another kind of a byproduct of what the submarines did. But yeah, the occupational force. I don't remember how far they were before they turned around. But once they canceled, or once the um, the four carriers, Japanese carriers, were sunk. They canceled the whole invasion force. But I, I got to think of that. You know, I think of uh, you know, Chris. I think like the the invasion forces uh, that we that we sent against various places but here here's this invasion force with all these soldiers who've trained to take midway and they've got all their equipment and they've got whatever landing craft they have or whatever and they get all the way up there and they get they're 100 miles away and then it's like oh never mind guys <laughs> never mind we're bringing you back to you know Rabul or Guadalcanal or the Philippines or wherever they go back to to eventually fight the whatever battles they're going to fight. But that's a yeah. The Japanese didn't have the air carry or air air support to sustain or protect their invasion force, and at that time they didn't know how many American carriers were there that could have caused them great problems trying to land on Midway. Well, and the last thing here, because we are running out of time, but the last thing to bring up here is that um, when you talk about victory disease, it doesn't just involve submarines, right? Because it involves the, the Japanese create this incredibly complicated plan where they take two perfectly good carriers that could have been part of the Midway invasion and send them off to the Aleutians because, oh, we're going to have a... We're going to devise a plan that's going to draw the Americans away here to the Aleutians. So they could have, had they chosen to, they could have had six carriers at uh, Midway. Now, maybe they would have lost six carriers, but maybe on the other hand, uh, with all those planes, they would have been able to hold back some, some planes for defense against carriers, and maybe they would have sunk the three American carriers. So that really is an example of Victor disease right there. Well, it, it is. And, and one thing we didn't really talk about that I just want to point on, um, this is all Yamamoto's plan. And if you think about trying to occupy, occupy Midway by the Japanese, that doesn't make a whole lot of tactical sense because you can't, you can't keep it supplied because it's too far from Japan. So it's like you have to ask yourself, what was Yamamoto's real plan? Was it to occupy the, the island or was it to sink the carriers, the American carriers? Because if you look at the approaching 
forces, jet, the striking force was to the north in ba basically bad weather. The occupational force was to the south in relatively good weather. So it's like they would have been easier to spot, which they were. And so was that Yamamoto hoping they get spotted, the American carriers come out, and then they attack the American carriers? So was Yamamoto using his occupational forces bait to get them out? It's like, it's like I'm, I'm kind of thinking that's, he was more interested in it, destroying the American carriers and occupying the island because it just strategically and tactically, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to occupy Midway like the Americans did. I mean, it was a hop, skip and jump from, from high, from Hawaii, you know, have a base there, but for Japan, that was a long way away and they just, they wouldn't have been able to keep it supplied. So, well, whether they wanted to occupy the island or sink the American carriers, it was an offer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, you're, you're waiting the whole show to say that, weren't you? We want to thank Mark Allen for joining us today. He is the author of the book, oh, I have it right here, Midway Submerged, uh, American and Japanese Submarine Operations at the Battle of Midway, May to June 1942. Mark, thank you so thank much for being so on the fun. show today. We really appreciate the chance to talk with you. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you right. so Thanks much so for much. joining us. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, uh, guys, uh, I know a lot of you are watching this week's show. And next week, we're going to continue on World War II, Chris, oh, yeah. uh, with a book that has uh, been very well reviewed and uh, uh, by a very knowledgeable author. Uh, uh, we're going to cross to the other side of the world and look at the dramatic story of the American response to the fall of France. And the book is When France Fell by Michael Nyberg, the chairman of war studies in the Department of National Security and Strategy at the United States Army War College. There's a there's a, a for you, right? there's a lot of credentials right there. So uh, mm -hmm. we're going to get his take uh, and basically... Uh, um, I think it was Stimson, the Secretary of uh, War, who said that uh, he thought the fall of France was the most shocking thing that yeah. happened. Uh, well, yeah, it's interesting. You know, it was interesting too because I was working on that World War One trip, and so many of the questions people had on that trip related to, uh, you know, kind of America's reaction to the war, and then later on what happened to France in 1940, and, and, and it all ties together. And it, it's, um, I'm excited to have it have it. Take a look at that. Yeah, so that is going to be our topic next week. And uh, please join us uh, for a robust dis uh, discussion on that. And yeah. also, in the meantime, please subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Facebook, shout at us on Twitter, listen to our podcast, back us on Patreon, and browse historyhappyhour.com. Yes, where you can find recordings of all the shows that we've done. You can so find, you can go there, you can spend days wow. yeah days actually we've been doing we have probably now. i think i think at history hour history history happy hour.com we probably have a hundred episodes so that would literally be like four days if you could stay awake through <laughs> Look, if you can stay awake through a hundred consecutive episodes of history happy hour we'll send you a hat there we go <laughs> like these picks like this yeah all right, all right. thanks everybody be safe